Thanks for being here, um, everyone. So we're going to get right. We have such an amazing. Um, Can't we get you a chair up here? No, because no, it's about you. Well, it's all about you. Um, <laughs> she wants. But so to we have such it. an amazing panel. I think that it's. I just really want to like let everyone showcase um, their experience around this event and this incredible book. So um, I'm going to try and go in order. We have Jane Cher. Um, she was owner and co-publisher of the Berkeley Barb during this. Wow. Um, Wow. Yeah. Exciting time. Um, next, we have Bill Petrocelli, owner of Book Passage, and witness <laughs> yes. to the Battle of the But Bar. I used to read the Berkeley Barb. That's the only way I find out what was going on. <laughs> um, then we have Steve Wasserman, publisher uh, and executive director of Payday Books. Yay, Steve! <laughs> Tom Dalzell, who is the author of this amazing book, The Battle for the People's Park, Berkeley, 1969. And then Robert Thompson, who is a former National Guardsman who was at the People's Park. Um, I really, I was not born when this happened, and so I, this is not a, this is not a learning experience for me, but I just, I really want to make sure that we understand the context of this battle, because when I think of Berkeley protests of the 1960s, I think of the free speech and anti-war movements, but this was literally over a virtually abandoned lot that was transformed into a park. It wasn't about free speech or the Vietnam War, but literally the community um, coming together and sharing something. And yet, this battle was deeply, deeply important. Can each of you talk about why this is such an important part of history um, and we're remembering it 50 years later? <laughs> Because we're sharing money. I'm going to make a stab at this. Okay, great. Um, my, my role in this book and uh, is less as a publisher, frankly, uh, than it is a personal stake. Uh, I and my family, among many hundreds upon hundreds of others, helped to build and defend that park. Hmm. I was then a 16-year-old Berkeley High School student at the time, I had been newly elected student body president, and had been very active and forever grateful to my parents for settling in Berkeley in August of 1963, and not in Orinda, <laughs> because it permitted me an enormously precocious adolescence. I learned to run a mimeograph machine from David Lance Goines, who was the printer for the free speech movement, and later the poster artist of Shea Panisse, among other many things. He liked to joke that he didn't see very much of the demonstrations because he was too busy printing the leaflets. <laughs> and was very active in the anti-war movement as it took place. And while you're correct, strictly speaking, that this was a battle over an undeveloped piece of property owned by the University of California, it was an outgrowth of all of those many movements that combined to produce a radical critique of American society as it then existed. Um, so much so that for many of us, um, we come to have a reputation for what we were against, but not very much about what we were for. And the idea for this park, which came as a kind of epiphany to a, a discontented, rabble-rousing uh, group of mischief makers and anarchist bohemians and other dissolute uh, rascals, um, was an expression in its most pure and I would say naive form of the politics of joy. Let's try to build now and let's try to live the life and the future that we actually wanted. What would that look like? Cooperating, making decisions together, taking um, a, a piece of abandoned property and making a garden out of it and through a kind of collaborative uh, through the collaborative genius of many hands, we could turn it into something beautiful, something worth admiring. And uh, to many people's astonishment, but not to the more cynical among us, uh, this inspired a tremendous hatred, not least from the governor of the state of California, Ronald Reagan, who had been elected three years before, who had vowed to the general electorate to, as he put it, so memorably and imperishably clean up that mess mm -hmm. in Berkeley. And 
the Berkeley students, and more generally the sort of emerging counterculture around the campus, was regarded as a magnetic pole for troublemakers and malcontents of all kinds. And it was his uh, desire to uh, batten uh, uh, his <coughs> political career by using Berkeley as a punching bag. And ultimately, that led to bloodshed. Uh, it led to bloodshed in the streets. And this book chronicles the 40 days uh, and 40 nights from the park's inception, from the moment the first sod was rolled out uh, on April 20th to uh, the so-called Bloody Thursday of May 15th, when martial law being imposed, National Guard troops sent, um, uh, curfews uh, uh, imposed, a military helicopter indiscriminately spraying the campus, causing school children in elementary schools as far away as a mile, a mile and a half, to wretch in their classrooms. Uh, this aroused the most ferocious protest that was ever seen in Berkeley's tumultuous history, culminating on May 30th, 1969, the Memorial Day peaceful march of 30, estimated 30,000 people to protest uh, all of this. It was the largest demonstration in Berkeley's history. It remains the largest such demonstration. And over the course of time, with scores uh, and hundreds arrested, many, it was the first time that the police and law enforcement officers from the state used live ammunition against white kids, anticipating Kent State a year later. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was something that those of us who were around never forgot. I've waited literally 50 years to publish this book. And over the course of a career in, in journalism at the LA Times and other publishers in New York, I came home to Berkeley three years ago to take up the helm of Heyday, an independent nonprofit press started by Malcolm Margolin 45 years ago this, this year. And when Tom came to me with the idea to do the book, he knocked on the right door. So um, unlike the other, the other four, um, you know, I, uh, I'm only the, uh, the seismograph, um, not part of the earthquake. They were all in their own ways part of the earthquake. And um, in, in, Steve gave um, such a free hand in this, where um, I interviewed long interviews with around 125 people, and then written statements from another 400 and some. And inspired by John Dos Passos and, and USA, in the book I go um, memory by memory, organized generally by, by the event. So there's not much narrative. I leave it to the reader to, to pull it together and make their decision about when, um, when Ronald Reagan or Ed Meese, his, uh, his assistant then, talk about how um, when James Rector was shot on the roof, uh, there were, you couldn't even see the pavement because it was filled with bricks and rocks. And when the sheriffs came in, they had to step over the bodies of their fallen colleagues. Well, rather than saying, that's a lie, I had statements from 40 people who were there and photographs showing nothing on the pavement, just the sheriffs aiming up. So I let the, the people who were there um, tell, tell the story. And it was an incredibly diverse coalition that supported the, the park. It was students, non-students, hippies, street people, neighbors, middle class neighbors, um, students, uh, graduate students, professors, um, other people from Berkeley. And it was not particularly sectarian. Actually, the sectarian left sort of shunned people's park. Uh, the, you know, uh, we could spend all night trying to list all the sectarian groups were there. The Trotskyists and the Maoists and the, and the Stalinists all thought that People's Park was a silly indulgence. Um, you know, there was certainly a revolutionary spirit in it and an anarchist spirit, but it was not sectarian. And um, it, uh, you know, it only lasted in that pure state for, for 25 days between building and seizing by uh, the by the by the university on, on Bloody Thursday, 
And you know, it, it of course has gone on since then, but it was um, an extraordinary event. It was very important for Reagan, but I think it was important for us. Um, you know, it, it's still there. It's not beautiful, it's not glorious, but it's still there. Um, and it was <clears throat> great fun to meet these people and uh, and and hear their hear their stories. Um, you know, Jane, there's a couple of interesting photographs in this book. One is Jane uh, with her then husband, Max Scher, and they put the Berkeley Barb out together. Max with a shovel. I'm, I'm, I find it a little hard to believe that Max actually was digging. Maybe he was. Uh, but then there's also a drawing by their daughter, Dove, you'll see in the book. She'd never seen crew cuts before. And in come the National Guard, you know, living with parents where she was. In came the National Guard. And she made a drawing that we have in the book. So, Jane? <laughs> oh. oh, well, about Dove. She was uh, seven and a half and eight. And she went to the park all those 25 days. You might want to hold the mic closer. Closer. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, has said that. Closer, please. There you go. Right up there. Right up there. Uh, it formed her political personality. Uh, which is such a revelation to me because, from my point of view, she has a rather Manichaean view of the political scene. <laughs> the scene, as she saw it then, was the people versus the pigs, the people against the pigs. Rather simple idea, uh, but it stuck with her. And I think that a lot of people were affected in that way. And um, speaking of changing the subject a little bit, about uh, the effect of the park, I think that it empowered Governor Reagan. It made him stronger and more popular. Uh, that's um, that was not what we that was not in our minds. It's only <laughs> at the time, but looking back, I, I do think that it had that effect, as well as uh, furthering the progressive. A, a, a state of mind of many people who sympathize with the park. I can dive in here and just um, kind of, my aim here is to facilitate you guys having a fun conversation. So um, I, can, I think I'm understanding everyone's connection to the park. Um, as after that kind of idyllic 25 days, um, where were each of you? And I, I hope to include you, Robert, because I think that this is going to be like twist. I usually go last. Yeah. <laughs> um, on that tragic Bloody Thursday, I mean, what, what did you witness? What were your experiences? And can you share that with us, please? Well, that's where I came in. Um, I was a witness to the, uh, the whole event. I was not involved in creating the park. I was um, a, an employee of the law school at the time working on a housing law project. And I used to go, and I was a graduate of, of, of Berkeley, and I used to come down to Sproul Plaza all the time, and I saw the people's uh, park being built. As a matter of fact, my own car was parked in a garage just a block away um, from the park. It, it seemed like a very peaceful endeavor. Um, and I remember the day that, uh, that the um, police threw fence around around the, um, the park. And my immediate reaction was, okay, this is a huge overreaction. And one of the reasons I thought that is that a couple of months prior to that, there had been demonstrations on campus regarding the Black Studies program. And the police had come out and the, I forget it was either the governor or the sheriff or someone had declared a state of emergency mm -hmm. with the governor, I guess. Um, good old Ronald Reagan. And they had put... Uh, a police headquarters right on Bancroft Avenue. I don't know if you're familiar with Berkeley or not. It's the south part of the uh, south boundary of the campus. In the garage right under the uh, tennis courts at the Hearst Gymnasium. And they made it a permanent headquarters for their operation. And at the time I thought of the, pe of the Black Studies pro uh, protests. I thought this was a bit of overreaction, but they did it. A couple of months went by, the whole protest died down, the campus was calm, and I used to go by there almost every day and think, wait a second, this facility is still there, this emergency facility 
is still in the same spot. And after a couple of months went by, I realized that as the People's Park thing started getting a little more tense, on the day it occurred, I realized that they were using that as a command headquarters for all the operation against the protesters that day. And I thought to myself, what the hell? I mean, this is basically a permanent, the university was under a permanent state of a police emergency for the, all those months, and nobody was being told that. And that's what, what they use as an excuse to bring the troops in immediately, the police in immediately that day. I mean, they were there before the, the march ever got down Telegraph Avenue, and I thought that was really outrageous. Second thing that, that formed me on that day was I was there when uh, Dan Siegel, the ASUC president, got up in front of, in front of the, uh, the crowd there to talk about this. And I realized later he hadn't planned to do that. Someone said, Dan, did you get up and say a few words? And he got up there, and what he said was, um, you know, I, I forget the lead up to it, but it ended up with, let's go take the park. Uh, and apparently the university or whoever was controlling the microphone cut him off and that became the de facto end of the rally, even though there were other speakers scheduled to talk. But everybody got up and they started walking down Telegraph Avenue, heading mm -hmm. down towards the park. Mm -hmm. And later on, a few months later, when the university tried to file a disciplinary action, I think they're trying to expel him or remove him as ASUC president or something or other, um, I remember calling him up and volunteering as a witness, saying, hey, I was there. I've been to law school, I know what inciting a riot sounds like, and I know what inciting a riot doesn't sound like. And this, he wasn't inciting a riot. All he was doing is making a comment. Could easily have been interpreted as, let's make a peaceful protest down at the park. But it wasn't within, you know, half an hour later that the students were walking down Telegraph and all hell broke loose. So um, I was mad. And I stayed mad all these years, and it's funny how you can still <laughs> you can still remember that 50 years yeah. later. I, mean, I think at the time, if I'm thinking or looking ahead 50 years, would I have any idea what I was doing? No, it'd been a complete, completely impossible to think of it. But now, looking back 50 years, it's like it was yesterday. Yeah. Wow. Two, two comments. First of all, Andre Gide, the great French writer, once confided to his journals that. He knew he, will, he would have entered old age the moment he awakened no longer outraged. Oh. So you are forever young. <laughs> I'm still young. I'm forever young. Um, <coughs> it's hard now, at this remove, five decades later, to really grasp, unless you were there, the moods that were so well uh, captured by the critic Grill Marcus when he called those moods of that era moods of apprehension, fear, fatalism, joy, excitement, desire that buffeted all of us as we swung wildly between cliches between the age of Aquarius and the age of the apocalypse. For me, um, what People's Park represented at the time, it represented the heavy hand of the state bringing the Vietnam War home. We were treated like the Viet Cong. We were rounded up. We were sent off to Santa Rita. It suggested that they would stop at nothing, uh, that uh, uh, the time for debate was over, the time for peaceful protest was gone. That summer, six weeks after uh, People's Park, the Black Panther Party held a convention in Oakland. I remember attending it. They called it the United Front Against Fascism. Uh, the doors, the soundtrack changed. It was no longer the young blood singing about, let's get together, everybody have peace. No, it was now Jim Morrison intoning dark lyrics about the end. Uh, it was 1968, and it was the Tet Offensive, uh, the the year the year before. Nixon had been elected on a on a racist law and order program. Uh, there was something called the Silent Majority, which no longer seems so silent, and apparently is still with us in some, you know vampiric form. Uh, and, and, and then, and then in, in, in July of 1969, I remember coming back from the United Front Against Fascism conference with my newfound comrades Tom Hayden, who was, a, who was preparing for his trial for having incited a riot with his uh, colleagues uh, at the 68th Democratic nominating convention in Chicago. He was living in Berkeley. We had become friends because he wanted to come down to Berkeley 
Berkeley High School and see this so-called sleep-in that I and others had organized among about 500 students who refused to leave the campus, uh, complaining uh, that to do so risked arrest or worse, and that we were going to stay on the campus until the streets, uh, until the military was withdrawn from Berkeley. I remember coming back from that uh, conference uh, to uh, the house on Ashby House that, that he lived in, and we were, watched Walter Cronkite uh, nearly overcome uh, at the uh, animation to show the moon landing that was occurring, and uh, mm -hmm. Tom drank steadily from cheap Almaden red wine jug, and Stu smoked a joint, and I spotted on the in the bedroom the, uh, a, a closet door ajar, and there was Stu's 30 on six rifle. Mm -hmm. Some of us <coughs> organized ourselves into little <coughs> collectives. Um, practicing surgeries on each other to sew up the wounds that we fully expected to suffer at the hands of police. Some of us took up M1 carving practice, going to Chabot rifle range, practicing where guns next to us were off-duty policemen also practicing, and next to them were Panthers practicing. Yeah. And that fall, I remember gathering. It wasn't on each other. <laughs> no. So uh, we we thought we thought a very dark night of fascism was going to set. We were wrong in many many ways, and much of people's part, I look upon in retrospect, in much in some of the same ways that Jane does, as a largely self-inflicted wound, and we gave to Reagan all the ways that were so. Uh, cynically used to demonize uh, the young and the left and to use all the powers available to the state as a cudgel with which to beat us into submission. And it was a dialectic of defeat. But I hope in this book, by reclaiming a bit of history which is vanishing as people age and forget and die off and pieces of our history uh, uh, get forgotten uh, and subsumed the vast Sargasso Sea of Amnesia, which is generally the condition of our political culture, that this will be a contribution, and I hope that such an autopsy won't mean that the moment of exhausted possibilities is at hand. <laughs> so anyone here, uh, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So, I want to thank you Beth for including me, right? And I usually do mop up at least a couple of times that we've done this now. Um, and Steve, thank you for also including me and Jane to be here and Bill I met you, so it's great to know that there. I was there. Anybody here in the audience? Were you there? Were you there in military? In the military? What uh, what unit? Five seventy nine. Uh, out of the 49th Infantry. Yeah, me too. Out of Petaluma. Wow. Out of Petaluma. <laughs> yeah. Right. So let's see if I have this right. I'll have it right from my perspective. What about you? I was a senior, and I had just gotten admitted to Bolt, and um, that's where I was. I was a senior at Berkeley then. And uh, one comment I'll make is that the National Guard was not frightening. They no. were basically, a lot of them were just people that didn't want to go into the army. Really? That was, that was George I, Bush I kind of thing. Totally don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was also, That's a surprise to me. <laughs> and it was also, um, you know, that was the nice part of having a draft. These were ordinary people like me. I was going to be drafted after that. And they were, they were not, you know, frightening fascistic characters. Maybe if they were fired upon, they would have acted like that in a mob situation. But they were not frightening. They were, I mean, half the time they were, hey, we're sorry we're here, you know. Right. The frightening ones were the Alameda tax squad. Yep. You know, <laughs> they look like stormtroopers. Yeah, let me start there. Um, for, for me, my experience, and again, depending on where you were in this whole thing, there were some of us stationed at the park itself, and a lot of us not. We were sort What's of roaming around. Sir? My name is Robert Thompson. And I was with the 49th out of uh, San Jose. Um, and we were in the artillery, but we didn't bring any cannons. 
And by the way, there were no tanks there. There were some uh, armored carriers, uh, personnel carriers, but no tanks. So that's sort of a uh, fact adjustment. Um, and I've read Tom's book, and the only reason why I'm here is because I was featured on the front page of the Chronicle back in the day, and the front page of, of uh, my own newspaper, the Murphy News, and so on, because I happened to be in all of the various things where people were taking a lot of cool pictures. And I'm that guy that uh, the woman uh, at the Chancellor's house uh, came up and hugged. And um, you see a picture of me on the Chronicle, and I've got my arms up, bayonet at the ready, and she just broke through and came up. and. Uh, the guy next to me uh, pushed her off, and she came over to me, and of course, you know, I was arms open, ready to go. Um, but all she was saying was, um, you know, peace, uh, love, and she wanted to put a, a flower in my hair, it's kind of a thing. Yeah. And we had our gas masks on, and, and <laughs> so, and bayonets loaded. But uh, that picture then brought me to Steve, because I've been telling my family about this story. I take my wife over to uh, Berkeley and shown her where I got engaged with various things. Um, when we pulled up the first day for me, we came up in our trucks, and I don't know the name of the street, but it's sort of right in front of the college, Main Street. And as we were getting out, and you can see in the book, there's a great deal of pictures of, um, quote unquote, the kids coming down the lawn. And from my perspective, there might have been 100,000, but there was probably a lot less than that. And we were obviously 20, 22 years old. We were kids, uh, just didn't want to be in the, go to Vietnam. Um, this was our way out. Uh, and we were trained. Uh, we had a lot of training in, in uh, dealing with crowds. I assume you did as well. Uh, so we got into our formation, which was a V formation with bayonets uh, mounted. And we started to separate the, the crowd. It became almost automatic with training. Uh, the next thing that I found myself doing, uh, and I'm not exactly sure of the timing because it's been 50 years, uh, but I was, we were clearing Sproul Plaza. And I got separated from uh, my group onto the right. I was by myself. Um, and the rest of them went to the left. And I got uh, this fellow in front of me that we were chasing the students, you know, why, who knows, we were just told to chase him. And so we did. And this fellow, um, you know, had some words for me, and just as a human being, it irritated me. And so as I was chasing him, and I think he was, he was probably about your size, he was a lot bigger than me, but I had a weapon, and he didn't. And out of training, I turned the butt of the rifle onto his elbow, and he did not like that. And he, so he turned on me, and training uh, had me whip my bayonet right around to his chin. Right. And it was easy that I could have done that inappropriately, and we could have had some blood. Um, it was easy that he could have overwhelmed me, uh, but he didn't. And then the rest of the kids came up and circled me, and I started. Obviously, we'd been there for a while, and we were really sick and tired of these kids. Really sick and tired. Of, thank you, Jane and Bill. <laughs> but we were just tired of the of the drama going back and forth to school. And so at this point in time, um, as these kids circled me and started to come in, uh, I just started swinging my rifle around at their faces. And what I was yelling, and if you ever get the video from Carol in, uh, I was yelling, I just want to go home. Yeah. So I, I was a kid. Um, I just wanted to go home. Yeah. Uh, I had just gotten married in March. I was 22. Um, and, you know, just wanted to go home. So uh, a day, day or two later, however, however the time went, we were at the Chancellor's house, and there's uh, plenty of pictures in Tom's book uh, with that, and that's where the women uh, came up and gave, gave me a hug. We were in line. Before that, we were in the parking garage across the way, and the kids, if you read the story, you can see the kids were all thinking about this too. They were coming over there, and they had there was people with, with ammo. I mean, some of the, the kids, there were some people that had some stuff going on there. They were thinking maybe they would cause some trouble. Not the actual students, I think. It was more SDS kind of thing, but I could be wrong. Anyway, we were in the parking lot, and the, the town had been gassed once or twice. And one of our majors in the parking lot started talking to all of us and said, you know, we're going to go over here and this is what we're going to do. Do you want to have us bring the helicopter? And Ask, just asking us, right? I mean, how 
What does this happen? And we told them, no, we don't want the gas. We can handle this. And we did handle it. And But I have to say, since, since dealing with this, I've had a lot of memories show back up. And during that chancellor time, the kids were out there singing the national anthem and America the Beautiful. Uh, all of these uh, patriotic songs. And here we were with our rifles and bayonets and what, I don't know if your unit had them, but we were uh, locked and loaded with bullets. Um, or as Trump says, we were cocked and loaded. <laughs> um, we probably had that too. But um, there could have been a Kent State big time uh, that day, but we held our own. We were the softer uh, pig, as you will. Um, the, the true problem people uh, that I recall were the cops and the highway patrol. And why I'm doing this, I you know, this is just for fun <laughs> and to help Tom and Steve. But you know, there's something going on in this country today, and I just like to be a reminder that most of the cops and the highway patrol and those folks were Vietnam vets, and they were trained to turn people into objects. That's how it worked. And that's why they treated the students the way they treated them, <coughs> because they were trained to deal with them as objects, not people. And that's why Donovan got shot, because it was just, he's just in the way. Um, that's why the kid uh, on the rooftop, James Rector. Rector, got killed, because he was seen maybe doing something, and then there were lies. Uh, from the cops. And the reason why I know they were lies is the story I told you about hitting the guy in the elbow. My unit commander saw me do that. And when I finally got reconnected with him back at the truck, he looked at me and he said, Thompson, I didn't know you were so tough. But he said, make sure you tell him he spit on you. <laughs> okay? These are the memories that are coming back, Steve, so thank you for that. Um, yeah. You know, and, and the guy that told me to do that, he was also a Sunnyvale cop. So this process through life tells me that not much has changed. And we have to be careful here. I have many cop friends, and none of them uh, are in that group. But many of them today, especially down in, on the border, they're treating people like objects. And this is something that we all, no matter what your politics, all be concerned about. I like that uh, you're mentioning that you just had to chase the students. Being chased was so much fun <laughs> because the National Guard, with the only very few exceptions, didn't hurt people. They weren't like the the um, the, uh, the sheriff's deputies. I think were the worst. That they tried to herd us into maybe a sort of cul-de-sac and get us arrested. Uh, what was the charge? I guess uh, resisting arrest. What was the charge? Why were we being chased? <laughs> being a student. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was. I think Total we were Rangers? being uh, failure the to clear. The area supposed yeah. to clear. I mean, um, yeah. failure to clear the area. Something like that. At any rate, it was um, exhilarating. Uh, but I thought I should mention, since I, my Reagan comments seem pretty negative, that I try to offset it by mentioning that um, when the park was created, it was such a beautiful experience that afterwards I thought it was rather like that quote, uh, the, uh, uh, that is uh, the poem by Wordsworth, um, Bliss was it in that day to be alive, and to be young was the very heaven. And that's how I felt then. Um. I think there's a danger in uh, romanticizing our youth. Uh, people, I've noticed that the golden days are always safely in the past. <coughs> they generally coincide with one's youth. <laughs> and uh, yes, it was uh, an exciting time. But uh, I would, uh, part of the purpose uh, of this book and corralling this sort of Greek chorus of witnesses and braiding it together is to uh, push back against the way in which uh, history gets flattened. Mm -hmm. 
and nuance gets squeezed out of things, and the complexity be it becomes simplified. So we get a story that gets repeated, like the one, and I think, Robert, you, 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 you touched on something really important. The complexity of the class differences as between law enforcement, Alameda County sheriffs, guys who've been to Vietnam, were trained for different purposes, coming back, their resentments against the perceived privilege of kids going to Cal. Supposedly the creme de la creme, the best the state had to offer, the showcase original campus. Uh, uh, they, they looked at these kids as flouting everything decent. We were at a hinge moment when, when the conformism of the 50s had, had now become the obstreperous uh, upstarts of the 60s. And this was a confusing time for quite a lot of people. And so uh, cliches flew about and uh, a lot of people did their very best to live that cliché, but uh, it tended to arouse in almost equal proportions a kind of rosy romanticism and a uh, sinking feeling that the whole country had plunged into a kind of moral, aesthetic, and cultural abyss. And it aroused strong emotions on all sides. One of the myths that got created was that the anti-war movement, uh, or that the counterculture, uh, had only uh, uh, hatred for, uh, for, for the GIs. But I don't remember that uh, at all. I mean, uh, in fact, in Berkeley, and not only in Berkeley, a whole movement was an outgrowth of GI coffee houses. And that woman who came up to you and, and embraced you was trying to say, hey, we have more in common than perhaps uh, our various uniforms, she in her perhaps batik tie-dyed you know, uh, dress and sandals, and you garbed uh, as, as one among many who, who looked, uh, uh, presented a frightening specter. And I remember, I still have a poster, or I now have a poster, uh, thanks to Tom, who, who, who found it. But I remember the July 4th, 1969 block party on Telegraph Avenue, which was sanctioned by the city of Berkeley only six weeks after this, this whole, all these events. There was a city-sanctioned block party Beautiful day, thousands of people turned out for this great celebration. The poster that was issued for that day, celebrating Independence Day, July 4th, was done by, it was a collaborative work done by two poster artists, uh, one of whom had done a lot of work for Bill Graham's Fillmore uh, posters to, to do rock events. And it showed a uh, GI, or perhaps a, a National Guardsman, uh, in military garb, with helmet on, and next to him was a guy who looked like, I don't know, like Jackson Brown or somebody like that. You know, he looked sort of, sort of hippie. And they were, they were united, there was a buckle that sort of united uh, the military uh, buckle and the sort of, uh, sort of big, sort of, uh, sort of a Navajo kind of buckle uh, that was being affected by the hippie character. And the slogan, it said, uh, celebrate America's independence July 4th, 1968, uh, Telegraph Avenue, and the slogan was, join us. So, and I remember my uh, compatriots, fellow pupils, uh, a couple of the women who were active in all this, after high school, they went out uh, to organize uh, coffee houses near bases. Uh, so, the, I'm not saying everyone did this, I'm not saying this was general, but I think the complexity of the feeling of that era and what people did, uh, gets lost in a lot of the telling of, uh, of, of, of these stories and of what has now come to be known rather generically as the 60s, as if all of the unruliness of that decade could be neatly uh, packaged into a, a neat decade. Uh, I don't think it can. This book is an attempt to suggest that uh, the um, experience the actual experience and the remembered experience of any history, whether it's your own personal history or the history of a city or the history of a cultural moment or a country, is not just a, uh, a, a, a tsunami of cliches. Would, would you hold up the 72, 73 for people to see? <laughs> yes, I can. Yeah. I'm going to embarrass you, sorry. Oh, no. Too late. Too late. All right, so there's Jane. Um, um, but I mean, I just find this, 
absolutely amazing that that I was able to sit down at Dato Ivra and talk about this all these years later, and you know, we're still there's still enough of us alive. And then on, on page 290, good show. Well, well, she's she's holding it up for people. Those who bought a book. Yeah. So that's your. Her. It's Dove. Dove's the first one. Dove. Yeah. Dove. Yeah. It's a great name. Dove. Dove and a pioneer um, on a on a flatbed during during the march, and just can, can we show them yours? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So that's a yes. On page three hundred and twenty um, is. Um, me. Our publisher. Yeah. Um, there. Oh, there you are. Oh, yeah. look at that. Yeah. 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 You say, oh, come sit by me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is very kind. There's Steve. But, you know, uh -huh. 50 years is a long time, but it's not too long to reach a story. Um, <laughs> Tom, can you tell? Oh, are we? Oh, no, I, 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 do you want to say a few words? I'd like, I'd be, well, I'd be interested in hearing what you remember. Yeah. 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 You want a story? Sure. Yes. Yes. You got one? Yeah. 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 The same year as Woodstock. Oh. Here, come, come. The same year as yeah, Woodstock was later that summer. Yeah. 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 It followed was in the two months later by Alpha. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 We, well, yeah, we got there kind of late in the game. Uh, the, what was it, the Alameda Sheriff Department were there. They had these big dodges with uh, four people in them, four, or four officers in them. There's a crowd there. They just gunned it right into the crowd. We saw that time after time. You know, somebody would have uh, tripped, they would have killed them. But the, these cops were mean at that time. When we didn't see what went on to build up to that. Uh, anyway, so it's the, the day that the helicopter came over. We're, de we're living down in uh, Marina? Ber Berkeley Marina. And okay, so you go up to the top of the hill. And I remember uh, we had, they gave us these Vietnam uh, flak jackets. Somebody put one on a tree and we were saying, you know, these things are supposed to stop bullets. So we were doing bayonet lunges. And the bayonet would go right through a, a black jacket. So we're kind of wondering, you know, they wouldn't really do much good with a bullet. So we're on the top of the hill, and it was the days of mini skirts. It was Petaluma National Guard. And all of a sudden they said, okay, get in the truck, and we're going to go down, you know, and do something. And there was helicopters flying around there, you know, the news media, working the kids up. And we were saying, no, no, we, you know, we don't we go down go. there, we're just going to cause trouble. Yeah. Why don't we just stay up here and watch the girls in the miniskirts? <laughs> <laughs> Smart boy. Okay. So we go down, go down and, and uh, where was it, Sprout Hall? There, Sprout was, Hall a, there was a flag, flagpole there. And I was about 10 people down from the flagpole, and the flag was at half mask. And so we could get in the line there in front. and. Uh, some kid goes over and he starts putting the flag all the way up. Or, or no, uh, no, no, they had, he, he was putting the flag at half mask or something like that. From here to that pole, the cop came up behind him and nailed him on the head with a nightstick and he went down and it was on a hill and he just stayed down and we watched blood oh. run down the hill and nobody went to him at all. And then, you know, oh, oh, and he, before he, they nailed him, he says, oh, you cops put the flag all the way up, now he's not dead anymore. And, and the people in my group were, God, what the heck are we doing here? You know, that doesn't make no sense. So, so somebody throws a bottle or something, okay, put your bayonets on, and uh, pretty soon somebody does something else, okay, put your gas masks on, and I hate tear gas, been in a bunch of it. Uh, it's terrible. It gets on your hands, on your arms. It, it's, it's, it's terrible. Not good for living things. Yeah. <laughs> so you know they get in the big. I'm not going to say. They get in the you know little argument there, and 
So they start throwing tear gas at the kids, and then all of a sudden you can hear the helicopter. They herded a bunch of people into what the plaza or something. Yeah, Norris Sproul Plaza. And then they came, you know, they came out towards us, and we herded them onto the buses for Santa Rita. Yeah, it was interesting. And one of the, one of the kids that was in line went back and sat in the truck. One of your yeah, one of the guys I was yeah, with. Yeah, we have people that did the same. They yeah. they decided they didn't want to. Yeah, it was interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's always good to have your wife here to remind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did what? The flowers, flowers in the middle. Yeah, they they oh, did yeah. that all over. Yeah. But, yeah. It, you know, but we saw the kids, the kids were really being brats, as far as yes, I was Jane. concerned. I mean, the girls pull their dress up over their head and say, come get it, boy. You know, because we're driving by <laughs> we on the trucks. Of that. <laughs> I mean, they, they were, kids were being brats, real brats, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> yeah. But not putting it nicely. Yeah. Pardon me? But not to deserve being gas. Yeah. 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 Anyway, that's mm -hmm. well you correl you correlate a lot. Now were you wow. in the um, were you in the special reserve up in Petaluma? Did you guys Yes, so you reserve, had to go to Yeah. So what happened was the National Guard uh, this is pre you know, pre pre Iraq and all this. Um, uh, we were into heavy training. Yeah, we had to go so three we had days to go three, you know, three weekends, whatever. We go down to Hunter Liggett, and we had to do this uh, yeah. mob control and this kind of thing. Um, but it did keep us out of Vietnam, <laughs> and I'm here to talk about it. Yeah. I don't think I would have been. That's right. Yeah. Oh wow. So yeah, I mean, I, you know, so many of my friends were went to Vietnam, and the people I trained with when yeah. I went into the military uh, for our active duty, you know, they didn't make it home, and so. You just know that you know, lots and lots of people got their life stuff now with that. And uh, when people came home, they were irritated that they weren't greeted like their, their grandfathers or fathers. One more thing. Hello, the National Guard got home, sent home after about eight days because of bad attitudes. Oh, oh, that's, <laughs> congratulations to <laughs> you. And it's, it's very important, um, and I just want to read the thing. People's Park gets found, it starts on April 20th, a month before, in March. And I'll just read this part. National Guard officers, Army advisors, senior police and sheriff officers, and private executives took part in an elaborate war game here in the state of California. The scenario is that an imagined arrest and shooting spark a riot. Dozens of radicals flown in on a chartered flight are picked up at the airport by 20 separate vehicles, and what follows is the ambush of several police cars, the attempted assassination of the mayor, the bombing of local armories, the destruction of vehicles and ammunition stocks, the gathering of thousands of people in the streets, hoarding of water in certain areas, sniping of fire trucks. Outside law enforcement is called in, but can't control the riot. The National Guard is called, but can't control the riot. The Army is called in, and finally controls the riot. This was a conference called the Conference of the Emergency Planning Council. It met in Sacramento on May 9th, 1969, to review the March war game exercise. Gaps were identified. They included communication between military and law enforcement, a delay in mobilizing the military, and a shortage of anti-riot equipment. And in less than a week, Reagan, who was privy to all of this and authorized it, would launch the all-out offensive against People's Park, using tactics and strategies that would learn from what had been codenamed Operation Cable Splicer. The elements were in place, not only within the state, but we also would later learn from the revelations that came from the church committee in the mid-70s about the shenanigans at the highest levels of both the Central Intelligence Agency and the FBI. And by the way, I say this, I'm by no means myself a conspiracy theorist, mm -hmm. but dark, foreboding uh, plans of very frightening scenarios were contemplated, exercises were carried out, and there was readiness. And what one of the things that seemed so frightening at the time with People's Park was that there was not only the readiness, but apparently in some of the highest circles in the country and in the state, a willingness. 
even even more than a willingness, a kind of lust to get to get it on, to bring it on. We we felt. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Tom, well, by my calculations, you weren't there. So what pulled you into this whole investigation? I never said I was there. I said I was the. No, no, I'm just. I was a seismograph. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I've lived in I've lived in Berkeley for 35 years, and be, become really drawn to the history of the 50s and 60s in Berkeley, the small steps leading up to People's Park, and seeing the 50th anniversary come, I said, well. People like 50th anniversaries, maybe I'll do a book. And then uh, Zeus or whoever said, Tom, meet Steve. Steve, meet Tom. And um, it, ju it just happened. And um, after a couple months, he doubled the budget for photographs. We have almost 300 photographs, right? And, and Many of them never previously published. Right. And, um, How did you find all of the people and... Archi like all of these archives, like, and how did you put it all together? Like, what was your process? Well, finding the people was all word of mouth. Now, Steve said, and, and, talk and, to and now, of course, what we knew is people would come out of the woodwork right. that we should have had in the book, mm -hmm. like right. the two of you, yeah. and, right. and among among others. Uh, but you know, history history's never done. Mm -hmm. you know? And and for the written accounts, just a lot of time with the Barb and the Gazette, the Chronicle. Um, and in, and in archives. Um, the Bancroft Library yeah. is a repository for many so-called witness statements that were taken at the time. And they're just like so many things in libraries. They're just sitting there, getting older and older, until such time as someone, for some strange reason, says, you know, this is sort of an interesting <laughs> thing. And they tug on that little thread, and they unravel a whole tapestry of memory that is on the verge of being lost. But Steve is part of this, the story of the of Berkeley High students. And Steve led that sleep-in of 500 students. The cover page, those are Berkeley High girls sitting in Sathergate with the guard. Um, not you. But maybe they weren't scary, but those bayonets were. Um, and then well, Steve knew, Steve, I mean, this... Uh, this 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 photo here near the end. Those are Berkeley High girls, and they weren't seniors. Oh no, they were they, they, they were 15 and 16 years old. Yeah. And 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 usually youth is associated with a certain recklessness, yeah. not unreasonably. But it also can be associated with a certain let's not call it recklessness, a certain courage, yeah. a certain audacity, yeah. and a certain wisdom that is granted to the young, which eludes the the old, uh -huh. who, who by virtue of their approaching end of days uh, are too timid and too afraid and they know all the vulnerables, they know the precariousness of the precipice. These women, girls on the verge of being women really, understood something in their bones that uh, everyone will tell you in a fight. If you want to take the fight out of a room, sit down. Don't stand. When you stand, you're in a, in a fighting position or could be in a fighting position. They understood a basic thing of civil disobedience. In front of a phalanx <coughs> of armed men, helicopters overhead, you didn't know what was going to happen, with several thousand protesters behind you, some of them hotheads eager to provoke something. These girls in the front line, they sat down and they began to sing as you said, said, patriotic songs. Yeah. And it was incredibly moving. And, it, and, it, and, and, and they demonstrated a moral fight <coughs> that commanded authority. And so that's why, you know, that we fortunately have a number of pictures of this. And, you know, I know some of these, some of these women are now, alas, no longer among the living. Some mm -hmm. of them remember. Every, every one of them remembers this whole, you know, I mean, this was, no one who was ever present ever forgot any of this. Although, again, as I say, it's strangely forgotten <coughs> the histories of the 60s. People's Park gets maybe three sentences, maybe a paragraph or two, but... You know, I think a lot of people suffer one way or another what has come to be called PS, you know, PTSD. PTSD. I can never get it right between the LBGQT and the PTSD. I cannot get the acronyms right. But, you know, it was a traumatic event uh, and worth recalling.
I'm going to leave a few minutes left. Should we do we should more, have questions more questions? Did you have one? Did you want to call on somebody? <coughs> yeah, so I have a question for the National Guard reps. I wonder how the mission was described to you before you got mm. here. Like, what Good were question. You given to expect? <laughs> what we were told? Yeah. Pretty much you're going to go there. Yeah. But like... Uh, so nothing, well, like no lies about what was going on and how you had no, to be really wrong. No, up. no, look, they, they've all brought it up. This gentleman here brought it up too. It's the Alameda County Sheriffs that were the just absolute rabid dogs. Mm -hmm. um, they had a thing, and I think Steve talked about it very well, in that <coughs> these kids were, you know, too fluffy and they needed to be given a lesson. Um, I don't recall exactly when we were mustering what they said, uh, the the event was somewhat in the news but back then. Of course, you didn't you know you didn't have social media, so it wasn't on TV or in the newspaper. You didn't hear much about it. Uh, but we were told, get in the truck. You know, we're going up there to deal with the crowds. Um, there was no. I mean, who cares about a park? I mean, when you read the book, you saw, you look at you go, why did they just let them build a park? But then Steve talked about it. it. Was they wanted to use us? as a tool to show. Um, and again, we were only trained in crowd control. The people that went to Vietnam were trained in objectifying and murder, uh, killing. And that's my concern for today. I, I, look, I can't get over it when I watch what's going on down south. Um, people treating the people the way they're treating them. I don't care if they're coming in illegal or whatever. They're treating them like objects, no toothpaste, the kids, it's just, it's bringing back all of these memories for me as to how we went in there and then the young kids singing the Star Spangled Banner while you're standing there with a bayonet and bullets and a gas mask. It doesn't get much more dark than that. So, um, and that's when you're 22. So, you know, you don't have much to go on in that. You know, my dad was a prisoner of war in World War II, uh, you know, came home, obviously, uh, but um, he hardly ever told his stories, but when he did, it was, you know, riveting. And when I tell my story, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, Dad, whatever. <laughs> you know, because it really wasn't that big of a deal. You guarded a park, ooh. <laughs> um, did you give him a copy of the book? They're starting to see it. They go, oh, finally, Dad has a release valve. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's not that anyone there was more brave than any others, mm -hmm. but when you get off of a truck and there's thousands of people coming at you, you have no idea if they're armed, um, and all of your, you just go into training. And, you know, and no, your attitude doesn't stay the same after a while, you know, and you just want to go home. So, do you remember what you were told? Pardon? Do you remember what you were told what was going on in Berkeley? No, actually, I, uh, the guys I was with, uh, we all went to the Watts Riot in uh, mm -hmm. Los Angeles to start with, and mm -hmm. People's Park was a bunch of kids acting up compared to that. Yeah. yeah. My brother was there. You know, I mean, they, the they put belt uh, beds up on top of the trucks. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. The movement of the 60s was also about not just the war, but the establishment, women's rights, the environment, right. all, of it. all those things. Yeah. And they all came together in the park. Yeah. I mean, there was a group called Ecology Action with Cliff Humphreys and a couple others that had started the year before. And it was the, there were groups of, of women. Judy Gumbo uh, among them, who had women's brigades going to the park. All of that was coming together right then. You're right. Was um, I'm just curious, my recollection now and at the time is kind of Swiss cheesy, because a lot of it, we were living our lives in between, all, all this right. stuff. When was Hayakawa at mm -hmm. San Francisco? 68. On the, on the um, truck. 1968. Yeah, the year before, San Francisco State. Was it also 67? Because I think no. I... No. 68. Okay. Now, the funny thing, too, since Steve has invited me to do this, I started doing, because I am a writer, author, and I started doing my own research to try to find out a little bit more about the National Guard side. And so I got a hold of a sergeant major up in Sacramento who was in charge of the archives. I haven't been able to tell you this, Steve, but I told Tom. And so we engaged in, through email, and uh, he... You know, I told him I was just a National Guardsman. I didn't say, you know, I, whatever. I just, I'm just doing some research. And it turns out that there was an arson. They have not been able to find out who did it. But all of the records from uh, this era 
up in up to then uh, were burned in 1972. Oh. <laughs> where were they located? Where were these records located? Sacramento. Sac it's at the National Guard ah. uh, archives. Mm -hmm. In a fireproof building that's designed to withstand nuclear attack. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody didn't want these. Uh, yeah, that's I, I can't decide that. All I know is that's what the Sergeant Major told me. And Sergeant Majors, if you don't know, they're the highest uh, enlisted rank. <laughs> And uh, so he's a big deal, and, and so I, you know, pushed a little, but I couldn't push too much, and so I'd say, come on now. But um, I wanted to share that with you, Steve, is that all that we got to get to the questions that we got. Questions? As I recall, at the time, the Quakers in the area got a telephone tree going to go out and stand between the forces of law and the, and the protesters. As the... Uh, <coughs> As they were planning that Memorial Day march, um, Fred Cody from Cody's Books and Roy Kepler, and Roy Kepler from Kepler Books on the Peninsula, both of whom had been C COs in World War II, um, got together with Quakers. And the night before that Memorial Day march, they trained 750 um, marshals for the march. Uh, the Quakers bought 30,000 daisies that ended up in his bayonet. Um, and, they, and they were just af so afraid of a repeat of Bloody Thursday, they wanted some adult supervision. And um, nobody was looking for trouble on, on the 30th. And in fact, we have um, accounts from the the National Student Association of, uh, of, of actually the, um, the Nixon White House not wanting blood on the 30th and having an FBI agent next to every Alameda County sniper on the roof. They didn't want them being stupid. So both sides, but yeah, the Quakers played a huge role. And uh, I don't remember the name of the young man that they had do the training, but. They, they did that, yeah. Books so always the rescue. Them. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Why not? It's my kind of story. I mean, I mean, for so curiously neglected an event, at the time, May 69, remember, a year earlier was May 68 in France. France was in huge upheaval. And in fact, the first demonstration in Berkeley in which the in which the police used tear gas in Berkeley to disperse a demonstration was held in June 1st, thereabouts, I was at that demonstration on the corner of Haste and Telegraph, held in solidarity with the French students. That was in 68. Uh, in 69, um, the events of People's Park was the cover of Paris Match. I mean, these, these images and some of these photographs, which became, to use an overused word, iconic, uh, really did go around the world. And uh, it sort of gobsmacked people. Uh, everywhere. Of course, all this was eclipsed just one year later with Nixon's widening of the war, the invasion of Cambodia, the largest student strike in the history of the United States, the killing of four kids at Kent State and two kids at Jackson State. And suddenly, the 70s were launched with a long hangover of the 60s. Um, I think we're, we're over time, so unless there's a burning desire, last question. Um, thank you to our wonderful guests. Wow. Thank you for supporting Hey Day Books and this enterprise. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's the we have all the zeal of having swallowed our own Kool Aid. So we, we, we believe in the books. And we believe in the bookstore. Right here, right? Well, anyone who buys one, you can have a signature. Can I have ten seconds? Yeah, yeah. Right. Count. This woman, there I go again. Yeah, Jane Sher was such a dedicated and loving mother, she didn't blink an eye when her daughter was dove in second or third grade. I always get this wrong. She was in second grade. She let her daughter drop out of second grade for those 40 days to go to People's Park every day That's and not great. go to school. Wow. And How did she turn out? What a great she, woman. She went to Harvard. Yeah. 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 So there's, there's the mother of the year right there. Yeah. Yeah.
about the yippies? The yippies uh, included, he met, made mention of Judy Gumbo. She was one of the founding uh, yippies. There were uh, Stu, Albert. Stu Albert, her partner and later husband. Uh, Paul Krasner, who had created The Realist. Jerry Rubin. Uh, uh, they, they were the principal. Uh, and what did the yippies young? Youth International Party. Oh. And they did such stunts as, you know, go into the New York Stock Exchange and, and bring it to a halt by actually casting dollar bills onto the trading room floor and traders stopped actually trading larger sums <laughs> just to grab the bill. You know. I remember hearing that. That was about 10. Yeah, and they, and they ran a pig for president. Right. But, but, oh, that's right. but, but yeah. I will say, even though it gets a laugh, yeah. um, I will say that one of the one of the untoward lessons of People's Park, which we learned the hard way, is that some of us um, came to believe, I think, in grave error, in politics as spectacle, mm -hmm. in theatrical gesture, and it was a bit waving the proverbial red flag in front of the bull, not really expect in in an effort, naively to think we could embarrass the bull mm -hmm. to stop the charge, mm -hmm. but the bull. Charged, mm -hmm. and the tusks, the horns were real, and blood was spilled, mm -hmm. and we weren't playing a game. They weren't playing a game. Real, real, terrible things could have resulted, and some of them did. So, you know, it was a, it was a life lesson that you need to be serious. This is not just, uh, you know, uh, a, th <coughs> a, a theatrical production in which we get to play Broadway and play to the media and to, you know. Uh, get you know people to um, you know take very grave risks because it's somehow all going to be a laugh line on late night television. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Important lesson to learn. Thank you so much. Well done, wonderful panel. We really appreciate you taking the time, and, and thank, thank you all for being here.